Hello, everyone. My name is Jim Sutter, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the U.S. Soybean Export Council. My team and I are excited to be with you virtually today for the U.S. Soy Connection Global Digit Digital Conference and Situation Report. We appreciate you all taking time out of your day to spend with us. In recent weeks, all of our lives have been impacted in many ways, and we've seen fellow citizens of the world suffer from COVID-19. I know our thoughts go out to those people, and our thanks go to all the healthcare professionals that are taking care of them, as well as, the, as, well as those in the feed and food industries that are providing the, the food and the nutrition for the world's hungry people. We're fortunate to live in a world today where technology allows us to come together to continue meeting and collaborating. We hope you find it worthwhile to be doing that today. We're excited about the content we have planned. You'll hear from globally recognized experts discussing the latest with U.S. soy and the impact that the COVID-19 pandemic is having on our industry. Before we get started, there are a couple of housekeeping items to cover that will guide you on how to interact with today's presentation. First, both sessions will be identical. The session you are in now, so the one that started at roughly 8 a.m. Chicago time, will be repeated at 8 p.m. this evening Chicago time. The same is true for tomorrow's sessions. There is only need for you to attend one of those sessions per day. If you'd like to ask a question during the presentation, and we strongly encourage that, simply type your question in the Q&A widget in the console. So in the lower part of the uh, screen, there's a, there's a little circle that has a Q in a little white box. That's the Q&A widget. Make sure all questions are submitted in this widget versus the chat area, because we wanna make sure we can address, adequately address the questions. If you lose your audio or video at any time, please refresh your browser. If you need further technical assistance, you can enter something in the Q&A widget and the team that is watching that will try and get back to you with technical assistance. At this time, thanks again for being with us. And it's now my pleasure to turn it over to the chairman of USEC, Mr. Monty Peterson, who will start today's session. Thank you. Hello, I'm Monty Peterson. I'm a fourth generation soybean farmer in North Dakota, and I currently serve as chairman for USEC's board. I'm also director on the American Soybean Association board. Thank you for joining us today. At past events in the US and abroad, I've spent a good portion of my time meeting with our international partners face to face. During farm visits, I have even had the opportunity to give our partners a direct look at our product and how it is produced. Today is a bit different as we are meeting virtually, but I'm grateful for this technology that allows us to meet with you, our customers, and allow the U.S. soy industry to remain engaged with you all. But before I begin, let me first express that our entire team extends our thoughts to all of you, hoping that you and your families and loved ones are all well in light of the recent COVID-19 events. Today, we're here to share an important story with you. Despite facing a public health issue and much global uncertainty, our farmers' commitment to producing safe and reliable soy has never wavered. U.S. soybean farmers are continuing to produce a high quality, sustainable and reliable crop and our soybean value chain is working diligently to ensure that exports continue to flow through the system and to our customers. U.S. soybean farmers greatly value the relationships we have with you, our partners. 60% of the soy grown in the U.S. is exported to international markets, which means that the family farmers like me that grow U.S. soy strongly depend on the support of global partners like you to sustain our families. And as we head into our planting season, we are ready and able to deliver the consistent and high quality soy product you need. The value of our partnerships is immeasurable. 
and something that helps differentiate the U.S. soy advantage to our customers. By hosting events like this one, we can address your concerns and learn directly about your challenges. To me, it's clear that collaboration is the best way to make things happen. That's true whether you're working with your peers on the next farm over or on another continent. And as we move ahead into 2020 and beyond, it is U.S. Soy's goal to strengthen partnerships and remain a consistent supplier to your industry and your customers. We hope you enjoyed today's session and our first speaker, Mr. Thomas Melke with Oil World. Analyzing the global supply and demand outlook is not easy. At the time of coronavirus, at a time of the COVID-19 pandemic, there are so many uncertainties. It has spread all over. More than half of the world population is affected in one way or the other by lockdowns or government restrictions. This is having a major impact on consumption and on production and on logistics. The damage to the global economy will be huge and massive financial support is required to prevent bankruptcies. Effects on the agricultural sector are partly opposed. Different directions. Vegetable oils are fully exposed to the bearish spillover effects of the plunging energy prices resulting from the price war between Saudi Arabia and Russia. Prices plummeted to around $20 per barrel compared with $60 at the start of this year. Biodiesel Consumption is declining, partly because of sharply reduced demand for diesel fuel. On the other hand, oil meal prices have rallied uh, due to concern about South American export delays, concern about insufficient arrivals at a time at which many compound feed producers had relatively little physical stocks. Animals have to be fed. There are effects on logistics, effects on field work, harvesting, planting. Will there be an effect on the plantings of the coming crops in North America or the winter crops in Argentina or the harvesting and there are of course a lot of effects on demand. Prices of oil meals rallied in March but lately came under pressure as we can see here in the slide because the Interruptions in Argentine and Brazilian exports did not occur so far. The global oil seed outlook. Increasing dominance of soybeans in the past 30 years, world imports of soybeans doubled every 10 years. Rising dominance of soybeans, other oil seeds, production of other oil seeds relatively flat. 
situation of oil meals, importance of soybean meal, uh, world production of soybean meal estimated at around 241 million tons in the current season, accounting for two-thirds of world production of all oil meals. And as you can see, the importance of soybean meal increased significantly over the past 30 years, and this trend is likely to continue. Fish meal shrinking, uh, rapeseed meal shrinking, sunflower meal rising slightly. Oils and fats, dominance of palm oil, palm oil accounting for about 32% of world production currently. Um, there are major changes happening at the moment. Palm oil production is set to decline, and I will point to this later, and, and, and this has opportunities for soybean oil and sunflower oil to gain market share. World production of all oils and fats almost trebling over the past 27 years, an average annual growth of 5.6 million tons in this period. But in the current season, we are going to see a decline in world production of all oils and fats due to developments, mainly due to developments in palm oil. Let us look now more closely on soybeans. World production is declining in the current season by 24 million tons. This is partly cushioned by record large opening stocks at the start of the season, which were up 17 million tons. Um, still, total supplies are down. Uh, biggest factor, of course, is to be seen in the shortfall in the US soybean crop by 24 million tons last autumn. Uh, but, but the new development has happened in South America. South American production of soybeans, instead of rising by 8 to 9 million tons in early 2020, is probably rising only by 1 or 2 million tons, or just stagnating, or probably even declining slightly. This is not sure at the moment. Harvesting is completed in Paraguay, very good crop in Paraguay, 10.5 10 10 to 11 million tons, record a crop. Uh, in Brazil, most of the harvesting is completed with record yields and record production in central and north Brazil. Uh, but in Rio Grande do Sul, drought, severe drought in critical phases of development is sharply cutting production. It's not sure how much there are some observers who, who say that the production is down by approximately 50% from close to 20 million tons last year to around 10 million tons this year. Others say it is 11, 12. Conab just released their estimate of 13 million tons. Um, I, I think Conab is still too high. Um, so it is very well possible that the Brazilian crop is only very close to last year's level, despite higher plantings. Last year was uh, close to 121 million tons in Brazil. This year, probably slightly higher or unchanged. Our number at the moment is 122.5. The Argentine crop is also declining. Weather caused damage in several major reg regions. It was just too dry during February and March when flowering and pot setting phases and it's particularly the later planted soybeans uh, which are suffering most. Uh, but the Bolsa de Cereales de Buenos Aires is uh, even or has even reduced their crop to 49.5 million tons we at the moment still work with 51, as you can see here. 
Uh, so there are some uncertainties, but bottom line, South American crops are not coming up to expectations, um, while at the same time exports, particularly out of Brazil, are at a record pace. So there is change, there are changes likely to occur in the in the in the course of this year. Uh, as demand is going to switch to US origin. Now let us look at world soybean crushings. World soybean crushings are recovering uh, in the current season and this is mainly due to China. The Chinese soybean crush has exceeded expectations in the first half of this year, in the first half of this season, uh, as meal demand is picking up. Meal demand has actually started to increase from a year ago uh, during October, March, which is somewhat surprising, partly also linked to reduced availability of rapeseed meal and other oil meals. So more soybean meal is required. Also for the now recovering pork production. World crushings of soybeans um, declined by uh, about or, or fell by about 12 million tons below trend last season and although it's recovering this season by about six to seven million tons it's still staying below trend. In China imports of soybeans are increasing. Stocks were very low in mid 2019. So the stocks had to be replenished and crushings picked up. So the Chinese soybean imports were increased significantly uh, by approximately 8 million tons in October, February as compared to a year ago. Uh, of which the US, the US provided 12.8 million tons uh, in this period against only 1 million tons last year, but Brazilian exports uh, to uh, China declined primarily in the first few months, uh, so which is October uh, arrival, October, uh, December, October, January. We forecast total Chinese soybean imports uh, to recover to 91 million tons, a very strong recovery, um, uh, but still staying below the previous high of two years ago, but still 91 million tons, of which approximately 21 million tons, we think, is likely to be imported from the US, which will require that an additional uh, 8 million tons will have to be imported for the rest of this year. This can only be done, of course, if, if China resumes purchases, uh, export sales commitments, commitments or undelivered export sales to China from the US are very low at the moment. We actually expect that China will become a more active buyer of US soybeans in coming weeks, um, probably soon, um, while Brazilian exports will start declining from a year ago, Brazilian exports to China from May or at the latest from June onward. In total, Brazil will probably uh, export 58 million tons, which is down uh, from, from last year's record uh, because of the lower arrivals of Brazilian beans in the first few months of the current season in China. World soybean imports, here uh, summarized in the, in the slide, world soybean imports are set to increase uh, to 155 million tons. This is our latest estimate. Uh, driver is China, but we also expect a pickup in imports into Europe. European soybean crushings 
will probably recover in the second half of this year, partly because of insufficient soya meal export supplies from South America, and also because um, some of the crushers will shift their capacity from rapeseed into soybeans. Yeah, uh, European soybean imports and crush were down in the first half of the year, but are seen to recover. Other, other uh, increases uh, are seen in, in Mexico, in Egypt, in Pakistan, in other countries. Now, what does this mean for the world balance of soybeans? Now, here a brief summary. Um, uh, with crushings rising uh, and, and other use also increasing, um, we estimate world stocks to be down by approximately 14 million tons from a year ago, 96 million tons. The biggest year-on-year -year decline in the US, yes, uh, naturally, after the, or due to the big production and big drop in production. But it's also interesting to see that uh, Brazilian stocks will be down from a year ago. Brazilian exports were, were front-loaded, close to 12 million tons shipped in March, and probably again close to 12 million tons in April. And if that is being done, uh, total Brazilian stocks at the end of April, total Brazilian soybean stocks at the end of April will probably be down by four to five million tons from a year ago. So Brazilian export uh, supplies are going to shrink for the remainder of this year. We are going to see some year-on-year -year reductions already in June, July, August. But still, end of August, Brazilian stocks are down, we think, about 2 million tons from a year ago. In the U.S., and here we, we show our U.S. soybean supply and demand estimates, record soybean crush exceeding expectations in February and March favorable crush margins, increasing export sales for soya oil and particularly soya meal, benefiting from the concern that South American export supplies will not be sufficient. A new record, 58.3 million tons is our current estimate, may still be slightly too low. We, we, have, to, we have to wait. On the other hand, U.S. soybean exports fell short of expectations lately, um, in, in the past uh, two months in particular. Um, we expect export sales to recover uh, in coming months, benefiting from uh, the developments in South America uh, and benefiting from rising requirements for soybean imports and crushings in China. U.S. planting intentions, most of the farmers indicated that they prefer corn, but in view of the recent collapse in ethanol demand and in ethanol production in the U.S., and the collapse of corn prices, uh, it's likely that several farmers will revise their planting intentions in favor of soybeans. Although the stocks are down, U.S. stocks are down from a year ago, they are still relatively high at the end of August this year, with larger soybean plantings and normal weather conditions contrary to last year, there is no supply concern at the moment for next season. Soybean stocks, world soybean stocks are going to be down. Our estimate is down 14 million tons at the end of this season, um, but with a normalization of or a normal crop likely to be expected for the U.S. Probably a new record for the U.S. 
this coming autumn, there is no supply concern. Stocks, um, lower South American stocks, yes, at the end of August, but world stocks in total, second highest on record uh, uh, at the end of the season. Uh, soybean prices have been relatively sideways. They recovered slightly. I think they are well priced at the moment. I see little downward potential, uh, except of any major weather disturbances. Um, uh, but also relatively little upward potential. Sunflower seed, sunflower seed moving from record to record, world production uh, rising to 56 uh, million tons in the current season, mainly on account of Russia and Ukraine. But um, markets for sunflower seed and oil are on fire lately after the Russian government announced an, an, an export ban, Russia and Kazakhstan, but mainly Russia, with no Russian exports of sunflower seed in the next three months. Uh, Turkey will have difficulties in satisfying import requirements. Um, sunflower oil prices have appreciated considerably uh, lately, widening the premium over soybean oil um, because of the uh, recent or previous large demand and the slowing down of the supplies for the remainder of this season. Rapeseed. Rapeseed production worldwide on a downtrend. Uh, in Europe, also Canada, production has declined last year partly because of deteriorated export prospects to China. This China-Canada problem is still not solved. Um, only two cargoes shipped every month at the moment. Um, so uh, the Canadian exports in total are declining. Uh, despite higher shipments to some other destinations. Stocks are relatively high in Canada at the end of this season. Um, uh, this is not, uh, there is not a big incentive for Canadian farmers to expand plantings for uh, the new crop. Uh, worldwide, relatively tight supplies for rapeseed. Uh, but this tightness is partly offset by a sharp decline taking place in European biodiesel production in the current year. We expect European biodiesel production to be down by at least 1.5 million tons from a year ago. Now turning to palm oil, 40 years of success story is probably ending. Many challenges, declining yields, aging trees, declining competitiveness and labor shortage. In the current year, Malaysian production is likely to decline significantly, um, partly because of the, the, the biological uh, decline in yields partly because of the yield effects of reduced fertilizer uh, consumption and partly because of labor shortage. And this labor shortage is likely to become even more severe because of the restrictions on traveling imposed by the Malaysian government as a precautionary measure uh, to keep the infection with the coronavirus low. Uh, so the plantations will have increasing problems in acquiring labor in the second half of this year. So the palm oil market is tightening. World production in the current season will be down by 
at least 2 million tons in October, September, probably 2.5 million tons or more, mainly in Malaysia. Also, the Indonesian production has, has turned out lower than expected lately. So the production side is uh, tightening. But on the other hand, there are also significant losses on the demand side. The biodiesel, the biodiesel uh, production is declining um, in some major countries and it's falling short of expectations in South America, in the US, in Europe, uh, in Asia, Indonesia, Malaysia. So also the palm oil demand is turning out lower than expected. Still, we uh, uh, see a uh, production deficit and palm oil stocks are declining. We see this here on the next slide, following three years of significant production increases by more than 8 million tons in 2016-17, 6 million ton increase in the 17-18 season and close to 4 million ton increase last season, palm oil production is now shrinking by at least 2 million tons. And with stocks already low at the start of this season, supplies are down even more. Consumption of palm oil, world consumption, after skyrocketing by 8 million tons last season, is now going to shrink. We don't know how much, but it's, it's declining and it's down by probably 1 million tons. This is our guess at the moment. We will continue to monitor this regularly and we will publish the results in our weekly publication and in our daily flashes and details of that can be found on the internet. World production of palm oil is shrinking. Um, soya oil is going to be up slightly uh, but stays below trend in the current season. Uh, further increase in sunflower oil but very little changes in other oils and fats. So the drivers, the drivers have been zoya, palm, sun and rape, if you like, rape to the downside, but uh, zoya and sun to the upside. For all oils and fats, we expect world production to decline in the current season. This is very unusual. The increase over the past couple of years, the average annual increase was five to six million tons. In uh, last season, the increase was four million. In 17, 18, the increase was more than 12 million tons. Now the current season, world production is declining. World consumption is rising. Um, we still assume about one million tons, despite the losses we are expecting for biodiesel. We are still, we still expect an increase on despite the demand losses resulting from the uh, coronavirus uh, problems and impacts. Uh, and this is creating a, a, a shortage and a further decline in palm oil stocks uh, at the end of this season, according to our estimates. Now finally, let us briefly look at biodiesel, our latest estimates. World production trebled over the past 11 years. It trebled world production of biodiesel and HVO. Reaching a peak of 46 million tons last year. Now for the current year, we uh, have revised our production estimates for the European Union. Uh, we now uh, expect uh, a decline 
of uh, at least 1.5 million tons, probably 2 million tons in the European Union. With current prices, discretionary demand and, and prices and price relationships vis-à-vis -vis fossil fuels, which has deteriorated incredibly, discretionary demand is virtually non-existent. Um, Indonesian production is not coming up to expectations. Um, this is a swing factor to watch. Um, B30 is very, very unlikely to be uh, fulfilled. But, but how much, how much will, will, will really be used in Indonesia? This is a very important swing factor to watch in the coming months. But we made a downward revision. Uh, Indonesian exports of biodiesel will be very, very small due to the developments in Europe and China. Uh, Brazilian, Argentine biodiesel consumption and production is also turning out lower than expected. Uh, so after, after the significant growth we have seen uh, in soybean oil usage and in palm oil usage in particular over the past couple of years, uh, 2020 is going to be a season of contraction. This is an important bearish factor to be considered. Uh, in the environment of lower than expected world production. And uh, we still don't know what the net result is. Um, and the market will sensitively react uh, to changes on the production and on the demand side of the equation, not only uh, looking at uh, biodiesel, but also looking at the development of food demand. How long will the lockouts continue in the important consuming countries and what effect will this have on overall food demand? There are a lot of questions um, and uh, uh, the market will also re react, uh, react um, sensitively uh, to developments on the production side. How is the Indonesian and Malaysian palm oil production going to develop. Uh, at the moment, the interruptions in Indonesia are still relatively small, um, but uh, we, we have to see um, whether this virus will continue to spread and to what extent this will affect uh, harvesting of fresh fruit bunches. In Malaysia, there is concern that lack of labor could significantly increase the uh, uh, losses, the production losses at the plantations. If the fresh fruit bunches are not harvested on time because of lack of labor or because of processing uh, facilities are closed because of government you know, uh, regulations, then the fresh fruit bunches will rotten in the fields and this will directly reduce production of palm oil and of palm kernels and thus also will have an effect of the supplies of palm kernel oil and on the lauric oil market. In contrast, if crushings are interrupted, transportation and crushings of soybeans are interrupted, in Argentina or Brazil or the US or other countries, the soybeans are still there for later consumption. So that's a big difference and we have to keep this in mind. Uh, with this, ladies and gentlemen, I would be happy to take your questions and if I can be of assistance to you, let me know. Thank you. Well, Thomas, thank you very much for that insightful presentation. As always, you take a complicated subject and you're able to present it and make all of those details, uh, you, you express them in a way that means something for many people. We have lots of questions coming in, so I'm going to ask some of those questions now. 
I think, uh, Thomas, you're you're with us on the telephone line. Unfortunately, you're not able to join us on video. Is that correct? Can you hear us, Thomas? That's correct. Yes, that's correct. Okay, great. Hello. Perfect. Uh, well, again, thank you for that presentation. Uh, one of the key questions we're getting from quite a few different people, Thomas, uh, and you mentioned a little, you talked a little bit about this, but I'd like you to expand on it if you could, is the impact of the lockdown that we are seeing in many places around the world or the people staying at home or whatever we want to call it, the impact on both meal and oil. You talked about the slowdown in oil and there'd still be a slight increase in consumption. What do you think about meal? And that's really driven, I guess, by meat production. So could you talk just a bit more about your thoughts on the lo the, the impact on soybean demand, meal and oil because of the lockdown that we're seeing around the world? Thank you. Yeah, well, this is very difficult to say at this stage. Um, uh, restaurants are closed in many countries, uh, cateens, uh, schools. Uh, so the restaurant demand is down. Uh, but on the other hand, home consumption is rising. Uh, so so what, this is partly offsetting. And uh, it's very difficult to, to say at this stage to what extent we are losing and what we are losing and what we are gaining. Uh, when, I, when, I talk, when, when I talk to the big chains uh, like, like uh, Lidl or other big uh, companies, uh, they, are, they are partly saying that they are uh, gaining in sales. They are gaining 10%, 12%, 13% in sales but on the, for, because of home consumption. But, of course, uh, the restaurant consumption is losing. Um, I would assume, bottom line, that it will be a net loss, um, particularly during this period of lockdown uh, and, and restaurant closings. Um, and we have to consider the negative effects of the recession, which we are which we are shaping and which which is right. which is Certainly. is coming. Uh, we don't know how how much and and how severe, but but uh, less income uh, is going to have an effect on consumption, yes. Okay, well that's something we'll certainly all be watching very closely, I'm sure. Uh, secondly, we're getting some questions about, um, as you can imagine, the China situation. Hard to discuss soybeans without discussing China, uh, since they're the world's largest consumer and everyone watches them. I guess the first of the China questions deals with the ASF, the African Swine Fever Recovery. And again, you mentioned this slightly, uh, but could you uh, elaborate a little bit on that and talk about, uh, I think there's a question about what percent of the total, uh, where we were before ASF and where we are now or where we'll be later this year. How do you see that developing? Do you have a, do you have a feeling for that? As uh, far as we know and basis the information we get, um, Peak numbers are recovering. Uh, pork production is still down. It's still continuing to decline significantly in the current year. But the numbers have started to recover. And on top of that, we are apparently seeing a change in feeding. Um, more intensive feeding, which is in favor of soybean meal, um, a, a more and more commercial feeding, a significant reduction of uh, household, uh, you know, private uh, pig farming. It's more commercial and more uh, soybean meal rich, plus more soybean meal required uh, to offset reduced supplies of rapeseed meal and other oil meals. Um, so uh, we... We indeed see a situation in which uh, meal, total soybean meal consumption in China is up, also because of uh, uh, rising uh, production of poultry. Uh, the uh, consumption in the current season will be up from a year ago. And this, is a, well, this was a little bit surprising 
the, the, the pace of recovery we have seen in recent months, and, and the meal, which turned out to be the driver for better crush margins and the driver for a pickup in Chinese soybean imports. Okay. Very good. And and that uh, you, you kind of led to my the second part of the question, uh, and this deals with the phase one agreement, uh, the, the famous agreement that was reached between China and the U.S., the phase one trade agreement. And it really is a it's a I'll call it the, the 40 billion dollar question, because the question is, will the uh, Chinese be able to meet their commitments? Uh, for U.S. agriculture purchases, and specifically what I think the question is dealing with is soybean purchases. And if so, it, uh, it, it looks like that will require a lot of purchases in the last portion of this year. Could you comment a little bit on that, please? Uh, yeah, uh, I agree with what you say. Uh, there is... Uh... Uh, there is, is more to come uh, if this target is to be reached. Um, uh, they are lagging behind in their soybean meal purchases. We haven't actually seen any uh, since uh, February. Um, but uh, considerable purchases of pork, of grains, right. um, of other agricultural products. But, yeah. Uh, there is more to come uh, for the rest of this year uh, to, the, to reach this very ambitious target. Yeah, certainly. I think everyone around the world is watching that closely. Uh, now let me change subjects a little bit and move to fats and oils, something that you know uh, quite something about. Uh, in your presentation, you talked about uh, global veg oil production being down slightly, uh, first time in several years that that would be the case. Uh, but yet we have uh, significant global veg oil stocks, which are burdensome in, in some cases. Uh, uh, how long do you see that it will take to work that inventory off after we get past the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, um most of the vegetable oil stocks which we which we, which are available are stored in the form of soybeans but uh, as uh, if we look at soybean oil stocks as such or of vegetable oil stocks as such they are currently not high um, palm oil stocks for example worldwide at the moment are down two and a half million tons from a year ago, which is uh, a lot, and the and the stocks usage ratio, which which normally is a good barometer for price trends, the stocks usage ratio is very low, is actually historically low for palm oil at the moment. Um, uh, prices have not reacted to this because uh, of the uh, uh, substantial decline in energy prices and the risks we are having now on the consumption side, uh, both for food as well as for biofuel, for which we don't know the answer yet. Um, but uh, in fact, several importing countries like, for example, India and others, they have very low physical stocks. And, and uh, this has to be solved in one way or the other. Uh, in, in form of increased purchases, there is a lot of pent-up demand. Uh, so the question, what is going to happen when this uh, lockdown is eased? Pent-up demand. As we are seeing this in China at the moment, China, China shows some kind of pent-up demand in several commodities uh, after, after the difficult two or three months uh, of uh, disease, and, and they are coming out of this uh, with, uh, with uh, quite significant purchases on the world market for commodities in general, also industrial commodities. Okay, very good. That's a very good response. Uh, now we are having a question here, coming back to uh, the subject of soybeans. 
Do you uh, you talked about Brazil and very large export quantities that they are shipping? Um, and you, I, I think you, you mentioned a little bit about the Brazilian currency, and that may be part of the reason. Do you think that Brazil? The question is: Do you think Brazil is over shipping soybeans and may find themselves in a difficult position to bridge the gap to its new crop, particularly if they continue to ship at the seasonal high levels? Uh, well, um, uh, f from which point of view, overshipping? Um, that's the question. The, the farmer uh, is a very ready seller. The farmer has, I do not remember that the Brazilian farmer has sold so much of his crop so early. And a as we are here today, they have already committed 20% of the crop of next year, which they have not even planted yet. So the farmer is taking advantage of the, for him, favorable um, exchange rate, um, the, the, uh, the uh, weakening of the real has created for him a very positive situation. So he is selling what he can and uh, uh, get, get rid of his soybeans very early to, to, capture, to capture this additional uh, revenue uh, and, and he, he, is, he is finished with selling much earlier than, than normally which will imply, as I pointed out, which will imply that Brazilian soybean exports will fall below the year ago level um, uh, from May or June onward. Um, so Brazil always have a seasonality and this seasonality with, with relatively high exports shortly after the, after, after the harvest, this seasonality has peaked and has been very strong uh, in, in March and April, um, also because the Chinese apparently have taken every effort to get the beans ahead of any potential logistical problems in case of COVID-19 um, would create in infrastructure problems and in, in shipment problems. Uh, so far, until until now, we haven't had any major export delays, which comes, which is a little bit of a surprise, but which facilitated this record pace of exports even until mid-April. Um, the net result is going to be that. Uh, at the moment, the U.S. is suffering. We have had very little U.S. export sales of soybeans to China. Um, but as Brazilian supplies will, will dry out earlier than usually, uh, the U.S. is going to come back and raise its market share for the second half of this calendar year. So, Thomas, just but to I follow up, I, uh, Jim, 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 I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't talk about over expectation because what is the scale? Uh, uh, it's, right. it's just front loaded, front loaded, taking advantage of the situation, which is partly currency situation, and 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 uh, yeah, do it. Sure. Yeah. And so a follow up question, uh, the normal time for Chinese soybean purchases from the U.S. Uh, when does that normally start? I guess what you're saying is this year, maybe it would come a little earlier. If it normally starts in September, it may come earlier this year or August. How do, how do you answer that question? Well, well, I, I, I think, think you uh, we, we have lost a little bit. We, we have lost a little bit of this. Uh, uh, well, what is normal? What is the benchmark? <laughs> last year, last, last season, the, 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 the Chinese started buying... Um, in, if I remember correctly, in April or May, which was unusual. Uh, but, they, but they had imported very few soybeans in the first half of the season, last season. So their stocks were alarmingly low. So they started buying in, in, the, in the second half of the U.S. season, unusual. I think, again, this year, China, after being being uh, you know not 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 buying after not buying for quite a while uh, china will come back 
already soon, anytime soon, um, in expectation of a slowdown of South American exports. And, and South America is, of course, not only Brazil, but also Argentina. But for Argentina, farmers are very reserved sellers. So it's very difficult to, to, take, to, to get the, the soybeans in Argentina into the export market. Um, so, so there are basically two major, two major origins for the Chinese, and, and one is Brazil, and, and this is now, now you know, uh, is, is, is soon largely shipped and largely committed. Uh, so the U.S. comes in, comes in the scene probably from May onward, or June, but no later than June. And this would be okay, this very would good. Be early, or it would be early, or it would be late. Whatever you look at it, it actually they they should have purchased earlier. <laughs> right, it depends the perspective. Well, Thomas, unfortunately, our time is winding down. I'm going to ask one last question, and then we're going to have to move on to the uh, keep on going with the program. But this has been great. Uh, the last question I'm going to ask is uh, about India. And India has taken a mandate to become trans fat free. How do you see this impacting uh, their fats and oils consumption, production, supplies, uh, that situation? Um, that's a very, very difficult question for me. Um, we have uh, similar uh, initiatives in Pakistan. It's uh, a question how quickly uh, this will be done. Will it be done at all? Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it requires changes in in technology. Uh, it's a very big country. Um, it, it it is taking time. This this kind of changes are, are going to take time, a lot of time. Um, I I would not expect any major changes to occur in the structure of imports because of that in the short term. Okay. Yeah. Well, Thomas, as always, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with our audience today. And today we really do have a global audience. So uh, thank you very much. I'm sure people have very much appreciated your comments and the ability to ask questions. I know you put your contact information on the last slide. And so if people have further questions, I'm sure you'll be happy to take those questions from them. So uh, I don't know quite, quite how we all applaud for you, but just, I, I just picture yourself hearing lots of applause in the air and people cheering your presentation. So thank you very much, Thomas. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, audience, we're going to move on now. I hope you uh, enjoyed Thomas's presentation as much as I did. Now we are going to uh, take a few polling questions. Uh, before our next speaker, uh, we want to pause for a couple of minutes to hear from you. Uh, so these polling questions will appear on the screen. Um, you should, uh, you should, uh, okay. How much has your demand for U.S. soy been impacted by COVID? You should click uh, on the, the uh, A, B, C, or D, hit submit, and then we will show you these answers a little later. After our next speaker, we will have these, uh, the, tab the, the results tabulated, and we will share them with you. So we have uh, five questions, I believe, and then we're going to take a five-minute break. So if you can stick with us through just a few questions here, uh, then we will go to a break. Uh, okay, so we did the first question. Let's go to the second question, please. Has the increase of inventories of global vegetable oils impacted your plans to purchase U.S. soy in the coming months? A, very unlikely, B, unlikely, C, likely, and D, very likely. So uh, we're going to give it about 10 seconds, and then we will move to the second question. Or sorry, the third question. Okay, let's go to the next question, please.
What is the likelihood that soy protein utilization will decrease due to interruption of meat and poultry production due to COVID-19? So the likelihood that soy protein utilization will decrease due to the interruption of meat and poultry production. Very likely, somewhat likely, or unlikely. I think everyone would really like to know the answer to this question. It's one that many people are trying to figure out. And even Thomas, our expert, uh, when we ask him this question, struggled a little with coming up with an answer. But we hope to get the answer from all of the experts that are experts that are participating here today. Uh, so two or three more seconds and then we'll move to the next question. Okay, let's go to the next question, please. Do you think the agricultural business world will change post COVID-19? Yes, dramatically. Yes, somewhat or no. I think initially when you look at this question, you say, well, sure, it'll change a lot. But then I think if you analyze it a little more and think about it, I think you have to, uh, you have to, as I said, think about this a little more. So it's again, a very interesting question and one we look forward to sharing the results with you on. So we'll give this one five more seconds. Okay, I think we'll move on. I think that's the last question and we're going to a break now. Yes, that's correct. So we are going to be on break. It is uh, one minute after the hour right now. Um, or sorry, it's three minutes after the hour right now. We are going to start at eight minutes after the hour. So you have a five minute break. We're going to start at eight minutes after the hour. Thank you very much for your participation and uh, especially in the question and answer and in the polling session. See you in uh, about four and a half minutes now. Thank you.
Welcome back. I hope you all had a well-deserved break after the first uh, hour of uh, interesting discussion that we had. Hope the line at the coffee area was not too long and you were able to get some uh, tea or coffee and uh, hopefully they were serving some cookies as well. So thank you for participating in our polling questions. Thank you for participating overall. It's now my pleasure to introduce uh, our next speaker. And this is someone who is known well in the world of agriculture. Uh, she travels around uh, actively giving presentations, sharing her insights and wisdom. And we're very fortunate to have her participating with us today. This is Miss Emily French, Managing Director at Concili Agra. She will be discussing the impact of several global events and their influence on the global soy complex. I know everyone will be very interested to hear what Emily has to tell us. And then as you're listening, we have the Q&A feature open. So go ahead and start as we're going through the presentation, uh, putting your questions in, and then we will spend some time live with Emily uh, going over that Q&A after she does her presentation. So without further ado, uh, let's hear what Emily has to tell us this morning. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, hello, and uh, wherever and whenever this you're seeing this, um, hello. My name is Emily French, and it's such a sincere pleasure to be with you in this virtual uh, digital conference. Now, I've been asked to talk today about this, this black swan event. Um, I'm not sure if it is a black swan event. It's more like an entire zoo of animals. The, the who's who in the zoo pick one. Um, it's Noah's Ark. It's bigger than a person. It's bigger than a country. It's literally, uh, you know, how your precise actions can mean life or death for another human being. And we will come out of this and the world will be changed what these changes may be. I have no earthly idea, but no question that change will happen. I do hope that we come out with a greater awareness, inspired by these incredible acts of generosity and kindness we have all witnessed and experienced, and with an entire new education of what really makes the world go around. Now, there's no question that it's agriculture that makes the world go around. Global agricultural continues to do what it does best, and that is feed and nurture the world. And it's never been more important in this time of uncertainty and fear and concern. So whether it's from the production or the harvest of goods to the manufacturing and processing of these goods and obviously the movement and transportation around the globe, in other words, you all are doing what agriculture has always done. And perhaps this time, more people will pay attention, learn, be educated as to the strength of global agriculture and its diversity and its relationships and in its community. For those of you in the front line, we are not only indebted to you, but we you have our humbled respect and eternal gratitude. Now, this digital conference is a very unique platform uh, that USEC's team developed in a fairly you know, narrow time frame. And uh, please join me in thanking them for this, not only for this endeavor, but in its ongoing service to the global soy complex and in truth for bringing us all together in this virtual reality. There is no doubt we will meet again in person and I greatly look forward to that day. So now until that day, you actually sit in a very rare position and where you can mute me for the next 25 to 30 minutes and simply follow along in the slides. I'm not sure if I've ever given a speech or a presentation where I could actually be muted. So maybe that's your black swan event and something else to thank you said for. So I was asked to talk about kind of the implications of the soy market place. And, and the world and kind of what we're seeing. And as I looked at this, I looked at it in a lens of pre-COVID and now post-COVID. And as such, I framed my talk in that vein to discuss the general price outlook for the soy complex 
and some of the pre and post situations we see around the world. So slide one, let's take a look at that. This is my market thesis and that I return to whenever I forecast. And I'll start with a spoiler alert. Again, you have the power of the mute button. So if you take anything away, we are range bound, period. Range bound, whether it's pre-COVID pre or post-COVID, those prices, again, have been and continue to be range bound. And there's a few reasons for this. The first four bullet points, first of all, demand uncertainty. You know, that continues. Pre-COVID, we had the demand uncertainty due to the China-US trade war. Post-COVID, consumer demand is questionable. When is the return uh, to restaurants, to air travel, um, et cetera? So demand uncertainty is a big one. And as such, this contributes to the range-bound market we're in. The second point, to break out of this trade range, you need a supply shock. Now, not a supply dislocation or an issue with food security, but a production supply shock. Pre-COVID, vegetable oils faced the potential supply shock with the drought in palm oil, and you also had biodiesel. So it was building towards that great risk. And now, not so much, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. The third point as to why the range bound continues is the essence of keeping risk limited. This started with the US-China trade war and it continues during COVID and likely post COVID in that no one wants to take any risk that they don't need to, okay? And a lot of that puts the physical trade much more in a back-to-back -back, um, type trade environment, right? So you're buying beans from the US farmer or the Brazilian farmer, and you're wanting to sell those directly to the end user and not build a premium book or a basis book. So again, keeping that risk limited. Now, world importers have the luxury of having the US as the most transparent market in the world, period. And this too, this transparent market has contributed to the range bound environment. The US, it holds 51%, 5-1% of the world's corn stocks without China. That is a luxury for world corn importers. It holds 18.5% of the world's wheat stocks, again, without China. And it holds 13% of the world's soybeans. And that does include China. And then the final point of the slide is the implied price floor uh, for Chicago futures. And that, that is really kind of the price level where I don't have any interest being short and I don't think the market does either. So in summary for this slide and the bottom line is that we are range bound. With US plantings, both corn and soy and spring wheat and sorghum, um, likely to be much bigger, certainly corn and soybeans, not so much wheat, but certainly will be bigger than in 1920. All right, so the next six slides, we're gonna jump right into the prices. And, and we're gonna look at the weekly price charts and the monthly price charts for soybeans, for soy meal, and for soy oil. So slide two is the weekly uh, soybean prices. As you can see, soybeans are really working around that 850, 850, um, versus the front month Chicago futures. It's, it's working around that area and the nature of the soybean, you know, in my 24 years of doing this, what we see, especially now with the global prosperity and the dietary shifts is that soybean prices really don't like you know, the nature. They don't like spending much time below sub 850, below 850. So I'm kind of using that as that, that oscillation, um, price line that we're revolving around. Soybean plantings will again be much bigger uh, than last year. And I do think they'll be bigger than the 83.5 million acres from the 31st of March planting uh, report. Funds, you know, what do the funds do? And we'll show that in the next slide, but this is the critical factor 
for the outright price action in the weeks ahead. And then the bottom line, really, when you talk about soybean futures and you talk about the US ending stocks for both 1920 and 2021, it is that that final number, whatever it's going to be, is absolutely predicated on what China buys or doesn't buy in the months ahead. So we'll go to the next slide. That's slide three. This shows the monthly soybean prices. And again, you're stepping back. You're taking a wider uh, look at these prices. This goes back to 1997. And again, we're trying to stabilize the market versus those 2009 lows. And to the price or to the chart to the right, that is the managed money um, fund position in the most recent data. And what that shows is you have a pretty neutral position that the funds are, are holding right now in soybeans. Um, if you look at the red line, that was the record short that we saw mid-May of last year. Um, and that was kind of at the height of the China-US uh, soybean trade war. So the biggest risk for soybeans right now is what funds do or don't do with that position. So be aware of the market structure. Slide four, we'll now move to soy meal. You know, for me, soy meal is the absolute critical leg of the complex. It, it has been. As goes soy meal, goes the complex. And what is most impressive about meal is that despite the flare up of the African swine fever over the past year, whether it's in China or other countries, and also the trade war of China and the US, what's been most impressive is that soy meal never broke below that lower trade range. And we'll call that say 290 to 295. That is hugely important to me when we look at a post COVID world. Okay, so you had significant demand destruction in China. It lost over 50% of its, its pig herd. And yet, meal did not break that lower trade range. So we have to apply this lesson um, it to meal in this post COVID war. So we've yo-yoed here, and we'll talk about this a little bit more when it comes to Argentina and its importance or logistics and transportation, that becomes very important uh, when it comes to soy meal prices. The next slide, this is slide five. This is a look at the monthly soy meal price chart. Again, going back from 1997 to 2020, and really it's moving sideways, but soy meal, and we've seen this in the last three weeks. So the price chart, when you're looking at the slide to the right, the back, black backdrop, what you see is the vertical move that meal makes when funds are buying or selling. The yellow arrow was the vertical move when meal prices went up $40 a ton. The red move here is the last week where it's retraced all of that for a loss of, of $45 a ton. And yet, despite this fund inflow and outflow and the risk of Argentina, again, soy meal is not breaking the lower end and it's not breaking that upper end. Testing, absolutely, but breaking, no. So again, meal range bound moving sideways, 335 to 290 on the downside. Slide six, this will be your weekly soy oil price chart. You know, poor, poor soy oil. You know, it's been absolutely hammered uh, price-wise since the start of 2020. And there's one thing I learned a long time ago uh, in Kuala Lumpur, listening to Anne Frick speak, was that soy oil's nature, it's very technical in nature, and it's very anticipatory. Um, it's forward-looking, not reactionary. And, and so usually what happens is soy oil will trade something that may happen three or four months from now, okay? And, and it trades, again, as I pointed out, very technically. And this is what's happened to veg oils, whether it's palm, soy oil, rapeseed oil, or sun oil. There was 
that pending tightness led by palm oil and, and the drought there. And so you have this massive rally in Q4 of 2019 and subsequent oil met cliff, cliff punched oil in the face and prices plummeted. Okay, so if you look at that weekly price chart, that shows that very clearly. And you also have the funds go from a record long to now a minor short. Bean oil is down 21% year to date. Um, if you compare that, if you look for a silver lining when you talk about oil, um, it's not as bad as Arbob. That's down 59%. WTI is down 62%, Brent 51.5%, so on and so forth. Um, as well, oil share, um, given Neil's collapse, has recovered from about 28% to now 31%. Okay, so that's the weekly oil chart. And moving to the monthly, this slide suggests, again, stepping back, Despite the upward trajectory in Q4 and the subsequent decline in Q1 of 2020, really soy oil sideways, it's going nowhere fast. Um, and it continues to consolidate versus the lows of 2015 and the lows of mid 2007. What's impressive about this probably more so than anything is that biodiesel demand has been absolutely clobbered. Um, as has ethanol. So more on this a little bit later regarding biodiesel, but the one thing to drill home on soy oil specifically is that I believe without a shadow of a doubt that soy oil is our canary in the coal mine to see signs of post-COVID consumer demand recovery. Especially in India, that's the world's largest veg oil importer, it's March soy oil imports were down 32%. Um, February, all edible oil imports for India were down 10%. And then you look at China, the world's second largest veg oil importer, and it's Jan Feb, palm oil imports were down nearly 25%. And it's soy oil imports were down 13%. So you have some maybe built up demand coming from those massive population hubs of India and China. Um, and, and we'll look to, especially China, um, to see what kind of consumer recovery uh, we, we see in the future. So those are your price charts for soybeans, soy meal, and soy oil. Now let's move to kind of pre-COVID and post-COVID and what we're seeing. So this is a look at the general global trade assessment. You know, pre-COVID, it felt like we were coming out of the US-China trade war, you know, that, that hangover, we're recovering, we're moving back into kind of a we are the world, kumbaya, um, globalization is good again. And, and, you know, there were all these demand hopes after the signing of the phase one agreement uh, at the White House. And many world importers that compete with China uh, for various goods around the world, we are all checking and rechecking the balance sheets of other suppliers and where some of that product sourcing may shift. And now in a post COVID world, we've seen the switch, uh, the focus switched from where these commodities are physically located and what export countries are at risk of export restrictions or food security or vulnerabilities. And that's what this chart to the right, the post-COVID food dependence, the countries in the tan, oranges, tan color, those are net importers, whereas the net exporters are in the green. And so because of post-COVID and um, the, the concern about food security and food pipelines, um, we, we've seen the market become much, much, much more sensitive to any sort of supply disruptions, whether it's an export restriction or a logistic issue. And nothing and no price chart makes this more clear than that vertical move that we saw in soy meal on the back of Argentina. Now let's be frank, you know, when it comes to Argentina, 
there's always concerns, whether they're strikes, inflation, the return of La Presidenta as La Vice Presidenta and Peronist policies, uh, so on, you know, the IMF, uh, de basic default. Um, but this risk for Argentina this time is COVID and transportation, of which Brazil and Argentina are heavily reliant on trucks um, versus the more robust rail and barge system you know, that we have in the US. So again, that global trade assessment pre-COVID, we were feeling much better about maybe a return of normalcy. And now post-COVID, supply disruptions become a much more critical factor um, in assessing you know, trade flows. Moving to slide nine, again, world supplies. Pre-COVID, world supplies, I think, are best described as adequate and ample. It was the second largest supply cushion on record, um, just over 105 days. And given you know, that there was that seemingly trade resolutions, and again, phase one, it was, okay, we, we've got these supplies, the world is consuming about 955,000 tons a day. Um, fantastic. There is no shortage of soybeans. Okay. But moving to a post-COVID world, suddenly it's, and moving to slide 10, suddenly it's, now where are all those exportable soy supplies? You know, in the case that you have a problem, with South America. So this slide shows where those stocks are. And when you look at this now as to where Argentina and Brazil and how they store the soybeans, and then to China and the US, what happens to that 105 day supply cushion is really it's more like 55 to 60 days, not over three months but rather about you know, nearly two months. And why is that? Firstly, China stores about 23 million tons. The world will never see those soybeans again. They will stay within the country and they will be crushed or they will be in the strategic reserves. And that 23 million tons is based on an import number of 89 million tons. The reality is that number is probably closer to 91 or 92 million tons. So again, going back, if the world consumes nearly a million tons of soybeans every day, you've got to subtract another two or three days from the supply cushion. So that's China. Now you have to look at Argentina, and Argentina obviously exports very few soybeans. They account for 5% of world soybean trade. They're also, if you look on paper, again, using USDA's April WASDI, because it's very transparent, and the marketing year ending the 31st of August, Argentina actually stores the most soybeans in the world, and that's about 28% um, of the world's soybean stocks are in Argentina. So if you back out Argentina's role in the soybean market, really Argentina, that's only about seven or eight days, with the remainder of all the world's soybeans in Brazil and then the US. So what we're looking at now is again, where are those soybeans? And more importantly, when you look at 2021 and the alleged phase one commitments by China for US soybeans, what we're going to see likely, again, if they adhere to those commitments is that you're going to see a big shift from US storing soybeans to China storing soybeans. So the risk there as a world importer is that China will be carrying more of the world's soy stocks and those soy stocks will not likely be re-exported. So moving to slide 11, again, following on this idea of where are all these commodities suddenly when we face a post COVID world, Let's look at how the three major exporters, the US, Brazil, and Argentina, how they utilize their crops, again, given COVID and transportation risks. So the first country we'll look at is the US, and its production will recover in 2021 based on higher plantings and higher production. It will recover somewhat of the 27 million tons of production it lost last year. In other words, 
it will return to that that role of supplying about 30 to 35 percent of the world's soybeans. The middle graph are U.S. Um, exports. The gray line is a percent of world trade, and the orange line is the utilization of its own production. So when you look at U.S. exports, that demand accounts for about 50% of U.S. production. So it ranges 40 to 50%, um, again, depending on the size of that production. And the U.S. exports are influenced by two major factors. One, China. And two, Brazil and what it produces or doesn't produce. And then you move to the third chart, and that's the U.S. crush. The U.S. crush uh, represents about 20%, that's the gray line, about 20% of world crush. And it's this year, it will have record, a record crush, given the, um, the margin environment there. And it'll consume about 50 to 60% of the crop uh, for crush. So exports and crush, when you talk about the U.S. Um, production, they basically account for, for a split there. Looking at Brazil, same exercise. The first graph is production. Uh, it's increased from 40 million tons in 2000 to probably 123, 124 million tons for this year. And record plantings are expected for 2021, given the record prices currently being paid. Um, on the collapse of the REI, which is down about 32% to date. Moving to the middle one, Brazil, again, the orange line being percent of its own production, the gray line being world trade. Brazil accounts for 50% of world soybean export trade, and it utilizes about 60%, 60% of its crop for exports. Brazil crush, again, Basic rule of thumb there is it accounts for about 15% of world crush, but as Brazil's production gets bigger, the percent of that crop used for crush declines. Okay, And so it's about 35% is how Brazil utilizes its crop. Brazil will be, when you look at exports and world trade flows, it really will be the key um, during the periods of February through August on a calendar year basis. And then moving to Argentina, pretty simple. Its soy production accounts for about 15% of the world. It utilizes, well, it, it accounts for 5% of world soybean trade. So most of that soybean um, is used in its domestic industry. Okay, so the soy crop, 80% of Argentina's soy crop is used for crush, okay? And its crush sector accounts for 10 to 11% of the world's uh, crush. Okay, so we've talked about where these soybeans are located, how they're utilized, again, in a post-COVID world where logistics become much more important, as does the phase one buying commitments of China. Now let's look at soy oil. So slide 14 is a look at that in that soy oil, we've talked about it before, but the edible oil, you know, it was the price, price puke fest of 2020. Um, it, the chart on the left shows that decline, precipitous decline um, as prices fell off the cliff. But I do think, you know, and it, and it dropped over a thousand points from the 1st of January to the early part of March. I, that is incredible. But moving into post-COVID world, again, this is the critical gauge for me, the most visual aspect of it um, for the consumer recovery. Soy oil for food use, right now it's projected to actually still increase 1.4% versus last year. And it accounts for a, about 81% of total demand for soy oil. And looking over to the far right is a look at the soy oil supply cushion. And that's at 26.5 days. So you're at multi-year lows when you talk about soy oil. Pre-COVID, again, talking about soy oil, pre-COVID, 
there was this enthusiasm and excitement of renewable fuels. You know, renewable fuels were the future. Um, you know, it was go green, save the climate, be green. And the graph on the left shows this lower left to upper right beautiful growth for the industrial demand for that. And it went from accounting for about 3% of total demand to about 19%, one nine for this year. Post COVID, now we have to ask ourselves, you know, energy demand, you know, what energy demand? The number of airplanes flying diminished. Uh, US gas demand, it's down 50% versus this time last year. That's the graph to the right. Um, you know, what does the market do when the consumer starts asking themselves, you know, having clean skies, this is pretty fantastic. Being able to see the Himalayas for the first time, not all bad. Um, you know, the conversations around the breakfast, lunch, and dinner table, because we're all, you know, staying at home, uh, you know, it revolves around, you know, do we need a car? Do we need to be driving? You know, how much money is being saved? So I think that's a very real discussion um, that will look much different in a post-COVID world. So that's kind of that pre and post for soy oil. Let's go to slide 16 and talk about protein meal demand. So in a pre-COVID world, we were very concerned about African swine fever, you know, and the challenges that presented. We were, the, the world market was moving through that, whether again, that was in China or other countries. African swine fever, presented a massive demand headwind for the market. Coming out of that again was the fact that still, despite this major demand headwind of African swine fever, the global meal supply cushion is just over 16 days, one six. And that sort of leads to why the meal market can get so volatile if there's an issue in Argentina. But those 16 days, that's the smallest supply cushion since that 2008-2010 period. Okay, so let's be very aware of this. And again, that was as there was demand destruction already, okay, already. And based on the April WASD USDA numbers, global meal demand, despite African swine fever, and so far despite COVID, is forecast to be um, 2.7% or up 2.7% on the year. So this is pre-COVID. Going to the next slide, post-COVID. And post-COVID, it is who else exports meal and what is the hit to the consumer protein demand? So the risk, and I've already talked about this, so I don't want to belabor the point, but the risk is Argentina. Um, and it, Soy meal was that first grains and oilseed commodity to really rock the markets in this, this post-COVID world that we're being in. So if you look at, just to, to keep this in mind, if the world, um, world meal exports, every day if export trade was perfect, the world is moving 183,000 metric tons. Okay, that's based on world export trade of 66.7 million tons, which is actually flat to declining versus last year. But 183,000 metric tons every day of trade was perfect or step. And to illustrate Argentina and its role, rather than a percentage basis, of those 183,000 tons, Argentina accounts for 83,000 or 80,000 of those 183. So in a post-COVID world, given Argentina's importance, we have to look at who else exports meal and how is that meal utilized? So these three graphs show Argentina, Brazil's in the middle, and then the US. So on the left, Argentina exports about 90%. So 90% of the meal that Argentina makes is put on a boat and shipped around the world. So that's to say that you as a world meal importer, you really don't face a domestic competitor 
for the meal that Argentina produces. Moving over to Brazil, the blue line is domestic consumption. And it's gone from 40% of the total demand for Brazilian meal to about 55% in the period from 2000 to now. Ergo, there's plenty of competition, you know, pulls and pushes when it comes to the domestic market versus the export market um, in Brazil. And finally, the US. So if you look at the US, its export pro profile is much smaller when compared to Argentina or Brazil, and it consumes much more of its meal domestically, about 72 to 70 74% of the meal that it produces is consumed domestically. Now, in the post-COVID world, you've got another wrench that's being thrown in the meal market. And that is the absolute implosion or collapse of the US ethanol sector. And it was, you know, remembering that that corn ethanol demand, this has been the huge growth engine for US corn since 2005 um, until recently. The question, now looking at protein meal, is what is the impact on DDG consumption, distillers dried grain, and where does this demand go? Where does, this, where does it shift to? Does it shift to more corn, to more wheat, to more meal, um, et cetera? So these two charts on this slide, the left is the weekly EIA ethanol production. The red line shows the production cliff that ethanol has gone off of. And to the right is distillers dry grain supply and use um, and, and how that is. So you've got the production being the red line that shows how much um, DDG was being produced from ethanol. The orange line is the feed and residual use. And then the blue line is the export. And the export and the feed and residual will be very interesting to see how that um, supply gap is bridged. You know, is it, again, more corn? But you also need energy. So there's going to be some sort of protein meal demand there whether it's in the form of soy meal or otherwise. Um, given this current price relationship, if you look at meal versus corn, uh, it does favor corn, but again, um, protein is going to be needed. The big question probably for corn is actually how cheap does corn get um, versus everything else. You have historically wide spreads between corn and wheat, um, and again, how cheap does it get if U.S. ending stocks for 2021 trend towards, say, 4 billion bushels rather than, you know, three, three and a half. Um, so you have a big supply push likely happening in the corn market in the weeks and months ahead. Let's look at world export trade, pre-COVID and post-COVID. So pre-COVID, World export trade was driven by China and its import demands where it was sourcing soybeans and obviously the phase one uh, China-US commitments. So to look at that, I think right now, um, well, we'll talk about post-COVID, but pre-COVID, China was the determinant factor, okay? And, and really when you look at that, we've got world trade despite COVID to still increase about 2.2%. Um, that is, again, if trade was perfect, the world would be exporting 416, 416, 416,000 metric tons every day. And again, remember, we consume 955,000 tons. So when you talk about the importance of world soybean trade, it accounts for 44% of that daily consumption. So that is a critical aspect um, for world soybean prices as well. Moving to a post-COVID world, the, again, China was, was the driver pre-COVID. Post-COVID, it's the utter collapse of the REI versus the US dollar. Um, this has been, you know, in this post-COVID world, we're really seeing currency 
drive trade, not only in soybeans, but, but in wheat uh, as well. Um, the REI USD is down 32% on the year. The Brazilian farmer is receiving record prices for this year and next year's crop. Um, they've, and they've been selling it as well. Um, so until there's a recovery in the REI USD relationship, it will be the Brazilian farmer selling that will largely dominate and set the tone um, for world trade. Okay. So remembering that in this pre and post COVID world importers, we've been trying to minimize or control whatever risk that could be. And one such control has been the back to back business rather than building a premium or a basis book. Um, so this continues to be uh, kind of the driver in the physical trade flow space. So again, pre-COVID driven by China, post-COVID so far driven by the Brazilian uh, currency and what the farmers are doing there. So this is my final slide. Uh, this is a look at the U.S. soybean balance sheet, slide number 22. Uh, this is my first look at 2021. Again, I think um, planted area uh, will be um, much higher at 86 million acres. Again, just the absolute destruction, demand destruction from corn um, should push more demand to soybeans, as well as you have the soybean, um, the, the hope of, of China demand in 2021. But net sum, um, I've got um, probably for 1920. Ending stocks at 500 million bushels. USDA took that to 480 in the April loss day that was out on Thursday. And for right now, I'm using um, 455, 455 million bushels for 2021. The absolute key besides weather, you know, and yield will be what does China import? What does China import um, from the US? adhering to, to those phase one commitments. That's really going to drive physical trade flows starting September forward. Um, so we'll see. Uh, I think the point to weather, um, the struggle will be is every time the funds, and remember, I think the funds, you know, what they buy or sell, that money inflow or outflow will be very influential in the weeks ahead. Um, They've tried to trade a weather risk premium or a US production problem, both in 2017 and again last year, and were completely burned um, in, in doing so. So I don't see the market really chasing um, a weather rally. I see the market trading or chasing food security headlines, but I don't see them um, really going after uh, the, the production risk that may or may not happen in the U.S. All right, so in conclusion, you know, this is what I have for you today on the markets. You know, I'd offer the following in closing. You know, as we move through COVID, you know, the value of a, of a day has never been more evident. The value of relationships, of clear and concise communication, and transparency has never been more evident. The value of free and reciprocal trade has never been more evident. The value of agriculture and its food systems, in addition to the world health care system, has never been more evident. The very fact that COVID cares not of country or nationality, race, creed, color, religion, sex, height, weight, age, has never been more evident. So stay well, stay healthy. Give thanks and, and give support. You know, reach out uh, because we're all in this together. And I'd like to end with a, a special, uh, just a moment of, of thanks um, to Carol Brookins. Um, many of you may have known Carol at her World Perspectives Days, um, at, at the Executive Director for the World Bank and many other things. Um, she passed away as a result of COVID-19. And I'm sure many of you have stories about Carol. Um, for myself, I'll always remember it is that she took time. And she was such a huge proponent of US agriculture and, and trade. Um, regardless of 
when I was at the start of my career or worked at World Perspectives, although she'd already gone to the World Bank, um, to the years that followed at various conferences or dinners in, in DC or New York. Uh, the way she viewed and experienced the world and how she could relate so many things that you would have thought uh, were relatable. Um, how she could take very complex thoughts and make them applicable and straightforward. Uh, to say that she was ahead of her time doesn't seem enough, so I can only hope that I bring a bit of Carol's unintentional teachings with me around the world. And remember, take time and take that moment with all of you. Until we see each other again, thank you. Emily, thank you so much for that great presentation. As always, you took, uh, again, many complicated things that we read about in the newspaper or hear about on the news, and you turned them into something that we in the commodity industry and trade could try and deal with. Uh, you made a comment early on. You said uh, it was an unusual opportunity that people could actually mute you, but I bet nobody did. I think everybody wanted to hear what you had to say, so I don't think anybody would have dared to mute you. <laughs> I'm getting some great questions here. So let okay. us, let's just dig right into a few questions. Is that okay with you? Sounds great. Okay, here we go. Uh, the first one has to do with um, uh, economics. Are all fiscal and monetary policy stimulus measures inflationary? Um, and if so, how do you think that's gonna impact commodity prices over the next couple of years, given the money flows we are seeing coming into just the global economy? Yeah, I think um, that's such a hard question because I don't, you know, we've unlaunched bazookas around the world when it comes to this monetary uh, stimulus um, and how it all plays out. Yeah, I just don't really know. Um, but I would offer this, you know, back in the mid 2000s, it was kind of, you know, the Yale paper and Goldman Sachs was you know, inflationary, you know, buying commodities was a hedge against inflation. That relationship and that money that was there doesn't seem to be there today. Uh, if you look at the value of the S&P or the equity markets versus commodities, it's at record low. That relationship is at record low. So it doesn't seem like the market wants to play a concern about inflation yet because we do need that supply shock. And I think once that supply shock happens, then you'll start this return of inflationary ideas and trades uh, will return to, to that money flow. Right. Well, that's very, that's an interesting perspective. And I guess that the, uh, there's a second question dealing with uh, commodity fund money flow. And I think you sort of answered that one, that it will take this supply shock before we see uh, funds wanting to jump in in a bigger way. Is that correct? Yeah, I think so. Um, again, in 2017 and again in 2019, there was this money flow that came in to, to trade a production problem in the U.S. And it seems like the U.S., no matter what the weather is, you know, it, it produces a very large crop or a near record um, crop. So it, it just once once twice burned, I think that's enough. And, and people will sit back and, and wait for an actual thing to actually happen and then react. Okay, great. Um, let me move on to another question. Uh, and this is more just uh, kind of looking at your opinion with your experience in the commodity trade. Uh, will importer countries uh, focus on suppliers that are more stable, legal contracts, have better transportation systems uh, during this time of uncertainty? Do you think that will start to be more of a factor? I would hope so. Um because we've, we've gone through periods where there's been um, phys physical supply uh, disruptions and it's always come back to that. So um, I know the world importers that I deal with, uh, that has become much more a topic of conversation than probably six or even 12 months ago. Yeah. Okay, so let's move. Uh, now I'm going to shift gears a little bit with the next couple of questions and talk about um, soybean meal. And you talked about soybean meal. Uh, and dis despite the ASF and the trade war, you talked about this kind of this floor that had been in place. Uh, the question is, why are prices so close to that floor? with the supply cushion at only 16 days. 
And how do you see the impact also of uh, less DDGs being produced? Do you think it will have any impact on that uh, that price floor? Will it will it change where the price floor is? Well, I think let's talk about meal right now. Um, I've been watching it because I really want to actually start buying some meal here. Um, but the, that fund money <laughs> that came roaring in is actually it feels trapped, right? So I think like we overshoot to the upside, we'll overshoot to the downside. Um, so we're kind of watching that, but I don't think the market actually realizes how small the meal supply cushion is to begin with. Okay, and because we have been going hand to mouth and spot and, and, and that sort of thing. So hopefully in looking at um, the, the, the situation in a supply cushion sort of way brings that realization. Um, because I think there are some challenges, certainly crush margins in both Brazil and Argentina are, are not glamorous right now. Um, that's a huge risk. The DDG is going to be probably the most dynamic uh, demand risk for, for the meal protein market. Um, because if you cut production of ethanol by 20%, um, you know, corn is not gonna replace that one for one on the DDG side of things. Um, so I think, again, the market's gonna have to be very, very aware of where those meal um, stocks are. And again, the issue with Argentina right now is that crush margins are just not all that in a bag of chips, um, nor a Brazil, so. Okay, good. Um, now I'm going to switch uh, gears again and go to China. Again, we have a very difficult time talking about uh, soybeans if we don't have a few questions about China. Sure. In your presentation, you mentioned China will be carrying a larger percentage of the world's stocks. Uh, what if they crush and consume these stocks rather than carry them as stocks? And do you think that will happen? Well, I think that'd be fantastic. I mean, that's your best case scenario, really, when you talk about if China can recover economically, consumer demand from COVID, that's a wonderful sign. And so if they're actually consuming that, that to me is much more positive for global economic growth um, because China is such an engine that stimulates growth that we'll see in its neighboring countries. You know, it's, it's not so much the need for the U.S. demand to recover. We really need China demand to recover and get that going. So I think that would be, that's the, the best case scenario in all of this coming out of post-COVID. Well, I will add my own question then and say, uh, if you had to rate that happening on a scale of one to 10, uh, what would your rating be? How do you, do you, do you think that's likely? Uh, I know you're a great student of world markets. What do you think about that? I would give it probably a seven right now. The, the one thing, you know, usually when I give these talks or when you talk about China, the one thing that we do time and time and time again is underestimate. We underestimate China and its ability to recover. So let's take some lessons that we saw from African swine fever. Again, that recovery has been a lot faster than, than what we would have thought. Um, so I'm going to give it a seven, probably heavily more weighted on that China is going to surprise us again. Um, now, whether those are real data points or, you know, a fictional or exaggerated uh, statistic from the government, you know, we'll see. But um, I, I would heavily weight that to, to China's going to pull another rabbit out of the hat. Um, that's what they do best. OK, interesting. And I know uh, coming up with hard data points in a situation like this are tough. So I think uh, this is where we rely on people like you who have a lot of experience and can help us uh, uh, create data points out of thin air. Uh, so another question regarding China, and this is uh, one we'd also ask of Thomas earlier, and this was on the whole phase one uh, program, the purchases, the purchase commitment that China agreed to in terms of agricultural commodities. The question is, how likely is it that you think China will achieve their uh, their phase one purchase commitment? OK, so Q1 data was just released this morning and they did just over five billion of U.S. egg farm products and goods. So we've got three more quarters. Um, China is under a lot of uh, political pressure. I think it's safe to say um, because of Corona or COVID. Um, 
you know, do supply chains need to leave China or other countries, India as well, and come and return to the U.S.? I think that with all this political pressure that you will see China, um, I think they do it. I actually, I, I really do think um, they end up doing it. And it's not just going to be obviously, you know, soybeans. That's going to be a large component of it, which is, it is fantastic uh, for the U.S. farmer, obviously. But it's going to be a host of things. I mean, ethanol has gotten right. dirt cheap, obviously. Um, you know, how cheap do the meats get? You know, because of the backup, uh, because of slower consumer demand in the U.S., we'll see. But I, I do, I, I think they do it for a myriad of reasons, um, but that it gets done. Okay, great. Uh, and Emily, unfortunately, we're running low on time, so I'm going to make this next question the last question because uh, we're already at a couple minutes over our allotted time for this overall total event. But I think people know how to contact you, so if they have further questions, I'm sure they would be able to. Uh, this question, and, and I just, I noted in your presentation, uh, and I don't know quite how the translators dealt with something called, uh, you had a vegetable oil puke fest. So I don't know how that translates exactly, but I think we all know what it means. Right, right. Um, uh, this question is, do you see vegetable oil stocks building globally to levels that could possibly constrain crush rates? No. Period, no. No. Um, the, first and foremost, you know, you, you, you can have a lot of discussions here, but if, if the world was concerned that we're producing too much, I would think that there would be some sort of carry in the, in the board, i.e. Chicago futures. There's not like, really, there's no incentive anywhere, um, to, to be storing goods. That's interesting to me. Um, it's also why when you look at the soybean curve, um, you know, the inverse, the actual inverse that you have from now until even new crop, um, that has become quite attractive uh, in terms of, of world soybean importers buying soybeans for January, February, March, you know, forward uh, because of that inverse. I think, that, I think that's been very, very attractive. So if, if there's a concern about supplies, that's certainly not being reflected um, in, the, in the cash market or again, in the, um, what we're seeing in the futures market. Okay. Well, great. As always, you, you, uh, you bring some real, you, you can shine a light on things that other people are worried about and help to give some perspective. So Emily, again, if we were all able to applaud, we would be applauding. I'm applauding for you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, again, people will know how to reach you, I think, if they have further questions. And as always, great to have you participating in our program today. Uh, so now, speaking of answers, it's the time to reveal the, the, uh, the, the, the replies that we received in our attendee poll. Uh, so we're going to read through the answers to this poll. Uh, okay, how much has the demand for U.S. soy been impacted by COVID? Uh, somewhat impacted. That seems to be the, uh, the, the between the greatly and somewhat. Those are the two top choices, but mainly uh, somewhat. I think that's uh, probably very correct. Okay, let's go to the next question. Has the increase of inventories of global veg oils impacted your plans to purchase U.S. soy in the coming months? Well, we have about an, a toss-up between unlikely and likely. I think if you look at all those results, those are probably the least conclusive results you could about expect. So, uh, so I guess we'll have to see. I think Emily just shared a little bit of a good perspective with us on whether or not there really is a, a surplus of vegetable oil looking at the carrying charge in the market. Let's go to the next, please. What is the likelihood that soy protein utilization will decrease due to interruption of meat and poultry production, excuse me, due to COVID-19? Uh, here again, somewhat likely and very likely seem to be the top two. So I think there's an awful lot of concern among people who are participating here today that the COVID-19 situation will indeed impact protein utilization. Uh, probably a safe bet. Let's go to the next question, please. Do you think the agricultural business world will change post COVID-19? And the answer is yes, somewhat. That's the 67% uh, of the people. Um, and I think that's uh, probably the answer I, I, that 
two thirds of the people provided, and it's uh, probably a very logical answer. We're all, I think, trying to figure out what the new normal will be once we um, release ourselves or are released from the COVID-19 grips that we are now in. Is there another polling question or was that the last one? I think that's the last one, okay. Well, just a few closing remarks for me and then we'll be done for the day. Uh, I hope today's program was beneficial for you all. On behalf of myself, the U.S. Soy family, and the speakers from today, I want to thank you for participating in day one of this conference. Our goal was to show you that despite facing a public health issue, USEC and our industry and all of our partners are working together to continuously innovate. And this includes the way we meet with customers. We hope that after hearing from our speakers today, you have a better understanding of how this pandemic is impacting our collective interests in the global soy industry. I just love to listen to people personally, like Thomas and Emily, uh, take all of these numbers and all of this data and try and make some sense of it, try and make it something that, that I can understand. I hope that you also uh, saw that as beneficial. We do know that there are many uncertainties and we're all having to deal with those as we uh, move forward. Uh, as we move further into 2020 and the years ahead, we will be excited to continue to meet and collaborate in old ways and new and exciting ways. Our industry is open for business and our commitment is to continue adapting to the environment to make sure we're moving forward and serving you as you expect. Working together is a key to our mutual success. I do hope that you'll be able to join us tomorrow. At that time, you'll be able to hear from U.S. soybean farmers who are in their fields right now, planting or getting ready to plant, so we can deliver the safe, sustainably grown, high-quality soybeans that you need. You'll also hear from U.S. soy exporters who work to move those soybeans from the farm to your processing plants or your point of demand, wherever it is around the world. I think they'll bring an interesting perspective as well. And finally, in addition on tomorrow's program, we're very happy to have Mr. Soren Schroeder joining us. He's the former CEO of Bungie North America, or of Bungie, and he will also join us to share the, uh, the perspective on the U.S. as a supplier to international markets and the impact of COVID-19. So finally, we appreciate you taking time out of your day to spend with us. We know time is a very valuable resource, and we're very happy that you shared some of yours with us. We hope it was a fair trade and you got something back from that. Uh, we're sincerely grateful to, for all of you, our partners around the world and our partners here in the U.S., who we work with every day to try and uh, try and do our job. We'll be making today's presentation available as a recording. Please stay tuned in your inbox for an email from your regional USEC representative talking about how you can get a hold of it if you want to. Also, uh, this is probably very predictable. After the close of today's events, you will see a survey about the event pop up on your screen. We ask you to take a few minutes to fill this survey out because we, this is new for us. Uh, I'm not sure if it's new for you, but it's new for us. We want to get better at it and only with your input and advice can we learn in terms of doing a better job? We truly will listen to the thoughts we receive in those surveys. So on behalf of the entire U.S. Soy family, uh, we extend our thoughts to all of you. In these challenging times, we're all navigating through uncertainty for ourselves, for our loved ones, for our communities, and for our businesses. We hope you are staying healthy and safe and your business is continuing to, to function and prosper. We'll see you tomorrow for day two of the U.S. Soy Connection Digital Conference. Thanks again for participating today.